Mm-hmm. My viewers, I bring to you the third part of season one of The Eminence in Shadow. Check out the previous parts if you missed them to view everything chronologically. When we last left off, Sid is participating in the standard Japanese practice of mixed bathing, much to Princess Alexia's discomfort. They discuss the goddess's trial briefly. It is essentially an event where combatants fight the ghosts of past champions. The ancient warriors of old tend to be picky about who they choose to fight, so many who sign up never get the chance to participate. Occasionally famous figures show up to do battle though, such as the hero Olivier. Alexia reveals that her reason for visiting Lindworm is to investigate the murder of the Archbishop. She then violates the rules of the Onsen by perving on Sid and insulting his Johnson. He retaliates by dramatically exiting the bath while reciting poetry about underestimating the mechanics of male genitalia. Alexia has an existential crisis from the potency of his speech. Later, the arena is bustling with activity and the temporary Archbishop Nelson introduces the festivities. Alexia is suspicious of his lack of grief. Sometime in the past, in Nelson's lair, he formally cancels the Crimson Knight's royal investigation of the murder, stating that the church's problems should be handled by the church. He not only makes light of the murder, but also undermines Alexia's dedication to maintaining order by insulting the Crimson Knights and her capabilities. Alexia remains enraged. Beta is here too, much to Alexia's dissatisfaction. She dislikes people who appear perfect, but also feels inferior due to her bust size, as is anime tradition. Beta maintains similar feelings towards Alexia from her familiarity with Sid, promptly fantasizing about being in Alexia's position as Sid's school homie. Alexia violently assaults her. The time has come to begin the trials. The Archbishop stomps his floor square, causing the arena to erupt into a glorious rainbow. A couple of spectators reveal that the participants pay to be trapped in there, until either they or the summon warrior are defeated. This fella fails to summon a guy, while Shadow fantasizes about making a dramatic entrance. Sometime later, with there only being one ancient warrior summoned, the trial has been fairly dull. <laughs> Sid is unsurprisingly called to fight. Rose must have pulled a few strings. Sid contemplates his choices, which all seem to be unsatisfactory, except for one. He makes his entry as the eminence in Shadow to confuse the matter entirely, activating the summoning by himself and calling in a strange woman from the ether. It's Aurora. The Witch of Calamity, who once reigned chaos upon the world. The Archbishop is bribed into revealing the lore behind Aurora, stating that her records have remained relatively unknown. Alexia deduces that Shadow must be at a similar power level as her, given that she was selected as an appropriate opponent. Shadow and the Witch share a brain cell together, then begin their duel. Aurora and Shadow dance elegantly through a passionate display of firepower, engaging in conversation with each subtle movement. Shadow is elated by the opportunity to battle with a worthy adversary, but encounters a disturbance in the manifestation of her magical abilities. Aurora is regrettably defeated, being unable to fight at full strength, and Shadow yeets off into the distance. The rainbow bubble covering the arena shatters, summoning some intricate magical nonsense, while Alpha cryptically comments on Shadow's call being answered by the sanctuary. The creepy magic door follows Sid around, forcing him to enter. Meanwhile, the Archbishop explains to the girls that this has never happened before, as the door inside the arena begins to activate. Beta seems pleased. The plebs are quickly evacuated, prompting the murder mommies to make their entrance. They begin to trickle into the sanctuary and take Baldi and Beta as hostages. Not so fast. Nefarious Nelson has his own tricks. Epsilon's carefully crafted breasts are slain. She slurps her boobies back into place and turns her attacker into paste. The archbishop is shook and then is taken into the portal along with Beta. The princesses decide to follow, despite being told to stay in place. Alpha explains that Shadow Garden is interested in uncovering the genesis of the cult of Diablos, and so their quest has led them to the sanctuary, the mythological resting place of Diablos' dismembered arm. She goes on to reveal that the hero Olivier was actually a woman who bears a one-to-one -one resemblance to herself. Archibald Bitbo gets aggressive by calling her possessed, which I believe is the meatball disease. He is silenced while Alpha continues to theorize that the cult has another goal besides resurrecting Diablos. She opens the floodgates to the memories of the ancient graveyard, conjuring her cool spiritual doppelganger. Meanwhile, Sid finds Aurora, who is pretty chill about everything. They casually discuss their circumstances. Neither of them know how to escape from Squidward's vacuous hellscape, but Sid frees her from her straitjacket anyway. Aurora explains that the sanctuary is a memory prison made from ancient battles, and that they might be able to get out by breaking its core. They also apparently can't use magic while inside. Sid and her get going as Aurora states that she will vanish 
vanish into nothingness once the sanctuary is destroyed. Shadow Garden's field trip led them to a postmodern facility, which Alpha recognizes as the ancient experimentation grounds for unethical orphan science. Speaking of orphan science, Aurora must have been involved in these practices, as her midget clone homunculus cries softly to herself in her memories. She slaps the silly out of that child, overcoming memory number one. Alpha continues to break down the lore, explaining that Olivier was one of the few children who was compatible with Diablos' demon cells, and that the cult's goal must have been to create a weapon capable of harvesting more of Diablos. Olivier was gaslighted into thinking she was maintaining world peace. However, the cult only wanted access to the raw power contained within Diablos' cells, hence the illicit pseudofed. Nelson is enraged. His fury is deflected by the glaring evidence that he himself gained immortality from the facility's sickening experiments. Alpha proceeds to extract the name of the drug, Beads of Diablos, and points out its flaws. The effects last for a year, and only 12 can be produced in that time, thus the membership of the Knights of Rounds capping out at a maximum of 12. Nelson breaks free from his baby restraints, but is instantly run through and tossed into a river. He turns into some kind of gross worm though, activating the sanctuary's defense mechanisms and separating our protagonists. Delta goes nuts, but Darth DeVito has the advantage in his own turf, allowing him to regenerate and spawn additional shadow clones. This only increases her bloodlust though. Meanwhile, Sid and Aurora find a battlefield oozing with lost hope. At its epicenter, the tiny witch huddles in a crater as Aurora menacingly brandishes a sword when suddenly, zombies. Apparently, the sanctuary is attempting to cleanse them, much like antibodies targeting a virus. Epsilon stumbles across a library filled with information regarding the meatball experiments. Taking pictures with their newly invented Polaroid cameras, her crew experiences the sanctuary's magic absorption. Epsilon's titties fall off in response. The zombie spawner breaks after being mined by an iron pickaxe, tossing Sid and Aurora into the center of the sanctuary. Smooth transition to a screaming Delta, who has been savagely slaughtering Nelson's clones in her underwear. He is confused by their strength and begins to unleash his full power. Delta isn't in the mood for patience and produces a massive slab of metal which smashes his pathetic army. Aurora and Sid figure that the key to opening the lock is probably this obviously placed magical sword. It seems that it will only respond to the Chosen One, a direct descendant of the hero. They are stumped, but I'm pretty sure Alpha should be able to pull that. Delta finally eviscerates enough archbishops to break out of the liminal space. Nelson is afraid. He calls forth the hero Olivier out of desperation. Shadow Garden's investigation is finished, and they begin to head out. The archbishop and his girl are blueballed out of a fight. However, Sid still remains. Just as Sid was contemplating the pace of the story, the protagonist he was waiting for arrives next to Baldi. He sicks Olivier on Sid. They have a remarkably impressive duel. Sid is once again elated by the opportunity to fight an opponent who can match his skill, conversing through battle with the hero and finding that she is mute. Aurora pleads with Sid to cease their combat, stating that no one is capable of defeating Olivier. Sid is confused. Nelson tries to barter with the witch in an attempt to recruit her, but fails after Sid insists that they continue to fight. Sid is instantly run through. Just kidding. Lol. He rips out Olivier's throat with his gnarly gnashers. Nelson is shook. It turns out that if you get stabbed in the right place, you don't die. Go figure. Nelson is twice shook. He suspends his disbelief by unleashing like a million Oliviers onto Sid. Unfortunately for the Archbishop, Sid has already found out how to manipulate his magic in a way that doesn't get absorbed automatically by the sanctuary. The army of superhuman girls is repelled as Shadow draws upon his bottomless supply of mana to unleash yet another magnificent purple explosion, which predictably obliterates the entirety of the sanctuary and likely a significant portion of the surrounding landscape. Somewhere in a dark dark abyss, Sid has a stare-off with Diablos' arm, freeing himself and Aurora from the prison of memories. The two are just chilling in the woods now. Aurora unfortunately must disappear due to being a spiritual being, but make sure to thank Sid for the beautiful memories they made together. Before evaporating like the morning dew, she suggests that should he ever find the real her, we don't actually get to hear what she says here unfortunately. Alexia, Rose, and Beta wander through the forest together and discuss what they just witnessed. Alexia is bothered by the grayness of Shadow Garden's morality, reflecting on the ethics of destroying an evil organization by sacrificing the lives of countless civilians. She feels discomfort in the absurdity of Shadow's power, citing her insignificance as a source of anxiety. Rose shares the same thoughts. Alexia proposes that the three of them become allies to investigate Shadow Garden and the cult to strengthen themselves and their respective kingdoms 
problems in the face of such overwhelming disparity. Beta plays the devil's advocate to her roughly hewn plan, but the triad of trust is formed to expose the truth of the world regardless. Later, Alpha contemplates the thoroughness of Shadow's firepower after being told that every trace of anything regarding the sanctuary was vaporized, including the holy sword. Epsilon also reports that the Witch of Calamity goes by another name, the demon Diablos. I am shook. Meanwhile, Gamma is purchasing property on the cheap when Nu informs her that they have prospected petroleum. Alpha has a flashback to when they first began to establish Shadow Garden. While she looks fondly on her meatball sisters, Gamma informs her that a new figure has emerged from the aristocratic power vacuum caused by the death of Nelson Perv. Asshat. Alexia reports to Iris the events of her journey to Lindworm as they sensually fidget in the sauna. She suggests that they do a full-blown investigation of the entire Church of Divine Teachings, but their father, the king, has been passive on the matter, insisting that Iris should not interfere. Iris deduces that they have two options, either find evidence or show him that they are capable of defending the kingdom. It is fortunate that the Bushin festival is approaching. If Iris can prove her strength through the tournament, then option number two will be easy. She then completely underestimates the supreme firepower that Shadow possesses as a being, stating that she will not allow herself to lose the tournament, regardless of whatever powerful artifacts Shadow Garden uses. As a cliffhanger for the next episode, Rose begins to turn into a meatball. The town is hyped up for the arrival of the Bushin Festival, as a collection of warriors from all over the world coagulate while Sid vigilantly poses. He passionately unravels his plans to melodramatically become the underdog of the tournament, before revealing himself to the masses as the eminence in shadow. Sid pays a trip to Gamma's palace to seek help in disguising himself for the tournament. He gets gooped up in some magic slime that transforms his face into a completely different person. Sid Kagano is reborn as mundane man, the pinnacle of mediocrity. Meanwhile, the town is visited by this lady, Anna Rose, who was the sole participant of the goddess's trial who summoned an ancient warrior. She tries to convince Sid to avoid entering the Bushin festival, but is dismissed. Sid is pleased by the efficacy of his disguise. He is even approached by a big guy who wants to cause trouble and finds pleasure in being viciously beaten by the hooligan, after which Anna Rose finds that mundane man may not be so mundane after all. Sid is pleased. Scale is determined to win big money by betting during the tournament and proceeds to explain his analysis of the various competitors while trying to acquire a loan from Sid. Sometime later, Rose sneaks up on Sid to tell him about her new friends slash collaborators and her regrettable betrothal to a certain man named Per. Of Asshat. She remains determined to continue the path of the sword, recalling the inspiration for that resolve. Sid is a real homie who shares his sandwiches. The next day, Scale attempts to procure the funds to gamble again, but is interrupted by Goldie Gilded, the glistening golden dragon. Scale is smitten with his exuberance as he analyzes the combatants of the next duel. His hubris is shattered like a moose on shallow ice, as mundane man claims another victory. Anna Rose was the only observer able to keep up with his lightning fast moves. Golden gilded goof goblin guy inspires Skell with his charms and wheelies his gleaming rod away. The next day, Rose has fled the capital after stabbing her fiancé, and that's the end of part 3 of season 1 of The Eminence in Shadow. Hey, thanks for watching. Sorry to end on a cliffhanger. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe for more of these kind of things. I have a Patreon if you're interested in paying me for these, since YouTube won't. Uh... That's it. Bye.